this conversation is so important and timely. It's in my view that the West has been very slow in responding to the tactics that Russia, the information influence and hybrid war tactics that Russia has been using to influence our domestic discourse. It's my hope that together we can start developing a far more comprehensive response as a country uh, to the manipulation of our information ecosystem in, in America, and that this is an important part of our series together, Tara, you know, in terms of helping. We're living in this new information world, and I think that we've been behind the eight ball a little bit. We've been behind in understanding the nature of the conflict that we're really in today. So we've got these two phenomenal guests. And, and to set the context is the reason we're doing this is that the Department of Justice and the, our government more broadly has really taken an unprecedented step to start countering the influence of Russia in our domestic discourse, even pointing out these influence operations where prominent conservative commentators are being paid extraordinary amounts of money through a Russian cutout, through a cutout organization to continue to push pro-Russian and pro-Trump propaganda. We've never really had this kind of smoking gun kind of stuff before, and it's created an incredible conversation in, the, in, our, in, our ecos, in the information ecosystem and in politics mm -hmm. about the nature of Russian influence and penetration of one of our two political parties. And so that's the context in which we're discussing. And Jury, I know that you work on this, you work with governments. I mean, just reflect on what you've seen over the last few months and how you think our government is now seemingly approaching all this in a slightly more offensive and aggressive position than they have been in the past. Thanks, Simon. I mean, I was really encouraged by the announcement from the DOJ last week. I think that we saw Russia play in the European elections earlier this year. We knew what was coming and it was a question. It was a question on whether we were going to have any offensive or if we were going to have any public statement to the public about what was coming, in part because we know the public does not always listen or understand the, the full dynamics of foreign relations and national security in that capacity. We know that foreign relations are often not a top voting issue, so sometimes it can be a cost benefit on what we're talking about in the limited time we have ahead of the election. But I think it was so important that they did talk to the public and make it clear just exactly what's going on. And in the case of Tenant Media, you have Russia picking conservative influencers because of what they're talking about to make sure they keep talking about what they're talking about and then add in some very specific talking points that serve Russia. It's pretty extreme when you look at what, for example, Tim Pool was saying, you know, it's saying that Ukraine is the enemy of the United States. Ukraine is the enemy of this country. Ukraine is our enemy being funded by the Democrats. I will stress this again. One of the greatest enemies of our nation right now is Ukraine. That blatant. And I'm really happy that there was an opportunity for the government to lift this up and point it out uh, to increase the chances that the public is aware that this goes on. Unfortunately, after 2016, there really was not easy ways to show the public some of this Russian interference because so much, so much of it was behind the scenes as happens with influence operations. Very hard to get to attribution, very hard to capture, very hard to put into a chart in a compelling way. And I think the public tuned out a little bit after there was so much bluster around what happened in 2016. And now this is just so clear cut. And I only hope that we keep talking about it in ways that reach people where they are online, podcasts, radio, in a format they actually are hearing, uh, because we know that the existing media space is so bifurcated. Jory, I, I do, I actually want to dig in more about exactly who was paid and why we think that was and, and those tactics and how how Russia has evolved their tactics. But before we do that, I want to zoom out. And Stuart, really, we have not, this is not actually the first time, right, that Russia has intervened in a presidential election. It won't be the last time. It really does feel increasingly like in our political elections in the United States that foreign uh, actors and especially bad actors are playing more and more significant roles and are actually much more closely entrenched as evidenced with this investigation, but also uh, Donald Trump's, some of his statements and his positions that he 
re reasserted last night on the debate stage or this week on the debate stage. And I would love to for you to help us sort of understand the context of the relationship and how it's evolved between the Republican Party and Trump in particular and Russia and the role that they are playing and why in this election. Thanks. It's, it's a real honor to be here. You know, by context, there was a whole generation of us who were drawn to the Republican Party by Ronald Reagan standing in front of the Berlin Wall and Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. And the beating heart of the anti-Soviet Union stand up to communism element of American politics was the most conservative part of the Republican Party. Cut to today. The pro-Putin element of American politics is the most conservative element of the Republican Party. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. This would be sort of like Churchill's party becomes the pro germ not just German, but Nazi party. So how did this happen? I think one of the under-discussed aspects of this is how much American conservatives admire Russia. And they look at Russia and they see this as a country in which there's only white men in charge. There are obviously, there are no gays in Russia, as Putin says. They see them all as this myth that they're all Christians. First of all, you think Putin's a Christian, you're insane. Secondly, as a huge Muslim population, a non-Christian population. They see it where elections are performative, but not decisive. And they like that. And we shouldn't underestimate that. You know, in all the presidential campaigns, I worked in five of them, there was always a lawyer, usually in our case, it was Ben Ginsburg, who would stand up and would tell people the rules of the road, one of which most striking would be if you're contacted by anyone from foreign an adversary or even an ally, you should immediately let us, the lawyers, know, and we will immediately, if appropriate, go to the FBI. I mean, it's it's just incredible to think that going back to 16, there was over 100 contacts between the Trump campaign and Russians. And bringing in Paul Manafort, I mean, Paul, I've known forever, right? I mean, Paul, Paul was a pirate. He was out there under the Jolly Roger. He would have taken offense if you had said, like, this is someone who's really operating in an ethical way. <laughs> like, oh, wait, wait, come on. Come on. And he was in that cesspool of oligarch money that was all over Eastern Europe. And he tried to bring a lot of people into it, tried to get my firm to work in those elections, offered us millions of dollars. So there was no pretense that when Trump brought in Manafort, he was bringing in a Russian agent. And what did they do? And they changed the platform to be more pro-Russian, less support for Ukraine. And I think that we have to look at this as the most successful covert operation in history, probably, certainly modern history. So what did they get? Putin supported Trump. Trump won. What did he get? Vastly more than they could have ever imagined. They got not just an individual here or there. They got a party. So now the Republican Party, to a large degree, its foreign policy is pro-Putin and standing up with Viktor Orban. I mean, think about that. Of all the Western leaders to say you were admired by, to pick Viktor Orban, as Trump did last night. And yes, there still is this other element, you know, Lindsey Graham and these people. But they're being completely compromised by the fact that they are supporting Trump. And you can't do both of those. You can't say that you're pro-American, you want to stand up to Putin and support the candidate who, even before he's elected, as he says, will surrender Ukraine to Russia. And there's a whole story here about money. And we've never gotten properly exposed the degree to which Russian money went into the NRA. And there were vast sums of money that went into the NRA. And there was a scandal with this woman who was uh, named as a spy and all this. The Justice Department announced the arrest of a Russian woman on charges that she conspired to act as an agent of Moscow to influence American politics. Despite a ton of reporting on Russia and Maria Butina and the Russian efforts to infiltrate and influence the NRA, we never ultimately heard of what became of that reported FBI investigation into whether part of what was going on with the NRA is that Russia was using the group to funnel foreign money into the 20. 16 election to help Trump. But trust me, this went much deeper. So think about that. That's one of the key constituent elements of the Republican Party, which was compromised by Russian money. 
and it goes just a lot deeper than people realize. And I think that it's extraordinarily dangerous for the country. And hopefully now it's it's being exposed. Well, can I just jump in? Is that I, you know the way that I try to understand this in my head is that the way that the Republican Party treats Russia today is the way they treat the Chamber of Commerce or some other large constituency group that has a lot of money that helps fund their campaigns and help them win and also has an agenda that they have to respond to. And and it's like they're one of the two or three biggest constituency groups that Republicans have to both profit from and then also be obeyant to when they have demands on the other end, like any powerful force. And I think that to me, in the last few weeks, one of the things that has been most shocking in the evolution of this nine-year journey that Trump has been on with his Russian allies is that two weeks ago, the GOP on their social media had a screenshot of the five leaders of the Republican Party today. And they were Trump, J.D. Vance, Robert Kennedy, Tulsi Gabbard, and Elon Musk, all of whom have been unbelievably enthusiastic pro-Putin propagandists in the last few months. And it was like an announcement by the Republican Party that they were now fully the party of Putin and not the party of Reagan any longer, like that the capture had become complete. It wasn't just a signal that was sent during the Republican convention in 2016 that, you know, we wanted to play ball in Ukraine. This was a loud, glaring, bright, you know, flame, you know, light out to Putin that, you know, the capture had been complete and they were ready to play. And I guess that gets me to my next question, Jerry, is that what does it mean that if Russia is going to escalate here and, and if they're going to fight for their guy in the next couple of months, what would that look like? Well, we know that much of what they do will look like fanning the flames of what's already happening in our country. They will find ways to make talking points that suit them, whether that is, for example, you know, the way the conservatives talk about DEI programs, the way the conservatives talk about what's going on with the border, the way conservatives just in general try to make another group of people other. That's very authoritarian playbook, very strategic. They will fan the flames of that. They'll do that across platforms. They'll do that in ways that are very hard for researchers or journalists to evidence. They can make trans financial transactions behind the scenes that are not you know, transparent in any way. When you're in your news feed, you would swipe right by it. You wouldn't suspect it. It would look like business as usual. They are also very likely, as we've seen them do in other places, blending into other spaces. So not the overt conservative talking points, but they are blending into online spaces where voters are perhaps black voters, perhaps diaspora voters, perhaps voters that have a certain in-group language. And when they're in those spaces, they're saying all types of things. Some of those things might sound progressive. Some of those things might sound neutral. And they can pivot at any time to a message that says, you know what, don't bother turning out. You know what, just stay home. It's not worth it. What is this system? It's broken. And we know they will do that. And they'll say it in a encoded language, in language that looks and feels like it belongs in that online space. And that's really challenging. They will also continue to co-op influencers. And when there's an influencer that they like, they will continue to double down on them, help those people get more reach. That's really challenging because that influencer might have and hold some of those opinions. And it's difficult to call out the American influencer for being co-opted when maybe they also believe what they believe. And that's where this gets really tangled up. And in general, I think that, you know, Last night at the debate, we saw really in a blatant way, I was kind of surprised how blatant Trump was in saying, I've got the hookup. I've got the hookup with, with Russia. And of course, the wind's going to be at my back. And whether or not I win or whether or not I'm actually in office, like I can make things happen. I wish someone would have said, why, if you can make things happen, why haven't you stopped the war already? You know, and, and, and it's just all of this sort of very overt, obvious Co-op, co-opting of the Republican Party, as you say, and there just really isn't enough strategic direction pointing at that activity in a way that's compelling and really breaking through to Americans. And in the meantime, it allows Russia to sort of continue to run some of these operations undetected. I mean, in the case of Tenet Media, you know, it depends whose story you believe, but it wasn't very hard for them to do what they did. They didn't face really any barriers. They used photoshopped resumes. They didn't have to work very hard. And so, you know, the same thing when, when the Voice of America, which was Russia doing 
a, a very similar doppelganger exercise in Europe earlier this year in the Czech Republic. When that came out, people were asking, well, how much impact did it have? And, you know, like, how do we really know, like, why they would spend their money on something like this? That's the one we found. That's the one that they felt was worth thing, that they felt was worth at least, you know, a couple hundred thousands of dollars. It is likely there are many more. Yeah. Likely there are many more that we can't find. And now we don't want to, I've worked in Eastern Europe for a, for a long time. I've worked in countries where the public is very tuned in to how state actors operate. Um, I think the case of the Polish elections are an amazing triumph in this, in this sense. And that's something anyone who wants some hope should look up. But we don't want to turn into a country where you're doubting every piece of information that you get. And we're already in that a little bit. And so a message, you know, out to the people who are thinking, well, how do I know? How do I spot it? Is it's not so much that I would expect to spot it. It's more that I would work, try to like make the content in your feed really earn your trust. Look for those transparency, that transparency information. Try to really understand who's behind what you're seeing and think through who benefits from me believing in this piece of information. Because if you can kind of think about the motives, it's a quick dotted line to you know, who benefits when, you know, Trump, who's got the Putin hookup, wins this election and, and who doesn't. You know, I can just share one personal example. Back in the Brexit days, I got a call from an English political operative who wanted me to come over and help with debate prep on these Brexit debates they were having, which I thought, you know, I didn't really think about it much. I thought, well, this could be cool. I don't know. Go to England. It could be, I, don't know. I hadn't really focused on it. And as I went down this path with them, it became really clear to me that the money that I would be paid with was coming from Russia. And we now have seen exposed how much Russian influence there was in Brexit. And I just think there's so much more of that out there than, than we have, have realized. You know, you know look, I, I backed away. I, as soon as I had any contact with Nigel Farage, I realized he's like one of the creepiest guys I'd ever met in my life. Um, so it was a very easy choice. And you thought to ask, Stuart. A lot well, of these content creators, right, have claimed ignorance. It, it, they, weren't, they weren't really trying to hide it. And I, I just think that the degree to which this money has floated around the party and in a post, you know, Citizens United way, it is so easy to do this, that, that I think it would take a full own sort of 9-11 commission study to get to the bottom of this and would prove that the Republican Party, the irony is the Republican Party has become everything that McCarthyism accused the Democrats of being. But this case is actually true. And I don't frankly see where it's going to improve from within the party. There's no center of gravity that will say, wait a second, let's don't do this. Because they've all compromised themselves into supporting Trump. And I, I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into the tactical side of how they spend and deploy the money. And because that also seems to evolve and just sort of meet the demands of the decentralized media environment we're in. And Jory, you are always the first person I text or call when I want to understand if something is moving more quickly, if it's already done the most damage because I'm hearing about it, and who has the most influence influence online, especially in spaces that certainly the traditional media does not pay attention to or report on enough. And so, it, you know, tenant media was really just kind of a pass through entity, right, of this Russian money. They didn't have massive audiences of their own. They delivered this money to far right influencers, content creators like Benny Johnson, Dave Rubin, Tim Pool, others. Can you, you, you have done so much work on this and also were very involved in the, in the 2020 election, um, I know, focused on disinformation. Can you give just a little bit for our viewers of context for who these folks are and why they were um, such useful idiots, um, essentially, in this, uh, in this operation? Sure. So to understand what happened, you have to understand the online apparatus that the conservatives are using all the time to reach voters. It can be easy to fall into the trap of thinking that it's just two echo chambers where Republicans hear one side and Democrats hear the other side. That's not really how the online landscape is functioning right now. First of all, you have the majority of Americans on Facebook, even though that seems like that trend is old, it's not. They're still majority on Facebook. They're on Instagram, they're on TikTok. 
Some of them around 22% are on Twitter. Certainly Twitter is full of uh, sort of opinion influencers, as we would say in public opinion research, but they're kind of all over the place. And depending who you are, you're getting personalized recommendations usually not based on your news or political interests, right? The majority of people are not news seekers, they're seeking relief from news. So think of people sort of floating out there, getting information on their different platforms. Now enter these conservative influencers. What is their relevance? Well, each of them, Tim Pool, Benny Johnson, they found ways to either hack the platforms and hack the algorithms to get their content to move further. So that's using really blockbuster headlines. That's using different growth hacking tactics over the years to build their followings. And it's not to say, you know, these are very, very conservative, very explicitly conservative influencers. It's not to say that that content is not getting in front of average voters because of the way that it can be recommended, because of the way that they will sort of interweave, uh, you know, sort of cultural commentary into what they're doing. For example, a lot of commentary on dating, relationships, manhood, uh, the common woman. We're hearing so much about how women should be in this election. Um, and that gets them sort of the boost of, uh, you know, the algorithm and the platforms looking at it and saying, OK, that's a relationship piece of content. Let's send this to anyone who's gone through a breakup or, uh, you know, they're talking about leadership and they're talking about coaching. Let's, you know, send that to the self-improvement crowd. So they make up just a small fraction of the very successful conservative online apparatus that has dominated in many ways online spaces since, since I'm going to say Obama's second term. I mean, you know me, Tara, I've said this a hundred times. We, you know, the pro-democracy actors were behind in 2016. So part of the story was that Russia interfered. And part of the story was that the pro-democracy actors did not keep up with evolutions in the information ecosystem. And in the meantime, the conservative apparatus did, and they made very strategic business decisions in how they were going to set up media companies and set up media apparatuses that were going to be able to absorb the changes to the information environment. So Benny Johnson and Tim Pool represent that. They're two people who kind of in different ways for different reasons were successful, had different versions of help. Benny Johnson, you know, long relationships with wider conservative ecosystems like the Turning Point USA ecosystem, the Charlie Kirk ecosystem. And what it sh shows us about a lot of these players is while they may have gotten in because they were some sort of like intern at a conservative convention where they were geeking out about, you know, who knows, uh, being mad about maybe the status of their relationships in high school, they are now there and they're really, you know, getting a huge payout. And I think it's important for viewers to think through, are they pulling, are they talking about the issues that are important to me or are relatable to my life? Are they talking about childcare? Are they talking about the economy? Or are they really kind of repeatedly bringing up these other points that seem to be based on their agenda or an agenda they have, or perhaps a paycheck they're getting? You know, I can just share, uh, if I could, in you know, 2012, Romney in that third debate famously came out and named Russia as the major geopolitical foe. Well, this is to Russia. This is, without question, our number one geopolitical foe. Now, because it was an election and a lot of stuff, you know, he was attacked for it by Democrats. Uh, a lot of the media scorned it. But what hasn't ever really been talked about is inside the Republican Party, there was not a cheering squad for Romney saying that. And they kind of kept quiet about it because it was sort of a skins and shirts thing. And if our guy's going to be for this, we don't want to attack it. But I was on the receiving end of numerous phone calls from conservatives saying, why are you doing this? Russia is our friend. And, you know, the reality is nobody cared. It wasn't going to change anybody's vote. This wasn't something that Mitt was saying because, you know, we tested it. You know, before that foreign policy debate, we even did a poll that showed that of those who thought that foreign policy was in their top 10 issue, it was less than 7% of the country. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't any sort of opportunity. Romney just believed this and said it. But that to me was this like very troubling early warning sign, like what, what they're calling, like trying to get Romney to back off of Russia. And it, I think just was very prescient on what was to come. We have a lot of work to do here to both understand and more effectively respond. And also, as Tara does every day, to go on offense, right? I mean, it's not just about response, I should say. It's about going on offense, being louder, making our case. 
Yeah, in the interest of relevancy, because we know that's exactly how these operations work and content creators work to get into the, the bloodstream and the news feeds of individuals who aren't paying as much attention. Jory, because you're such an expert on this, what are some things that people that are listening can do when they are uh, sort of floating around in their echo chambers, et cetera, and encountering things of this nature, or more importantly, probably to be more proactive and offensive? I can't emphasize enough how important it is to engage with content that is fact-based or even just content you find compelling that is telling this story in a way that you think is relatable to people in your life. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to do so on multiple platforms, whether you are forwarding a chain email to the older loved ones in your life, whether you are DMing 10 people when you see a really compelling Instagram reel that is explaining a complicated topic, it is so important because that is how that kind of, that content is going to go further and get the automatic amplification. And I think you know better than anyone, Tara, we've seen the platforms actually opt people out of political content this year. So they've opted you out. And unless you opt back in, which as I said, it's not likely people are like running to opt themselves back into the political commentary happening in our country. They're not getting that information. And so this is a conversation, I mean, I think all of us are unique in that we care a lot about foreign relations, foreign policy. We know that that's just not necessarily where the rest of the country is. However, when, the, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, it's my belief that Putin over-indexed on how much he could count on the anti-woke sentiment directly translating into support for him. I think he miscalculated that because there were a majority of Americans that said, we are pro-Ukraine, we know where we stand in this. And while they have been chipping away, and while you might not be able to say the same thing about the majority of the Republican Party, Americans actually do understand. They do understand where we stand on this, and they do understand which side stands for freedom. And so assuming that people are following along, assuming that people are reading long op-eds is the wrong assumption. You have to assume that no one's reading anything about this, no one's heard about it, and you have to find short, compelling ways to repeatedly talk about the things that are important to you in this election, whether it's this story or something else. You have to repeat yourself many times to, in order to break through. And that's something that Russia knows conservatives do really well. So all they had to do was wire $400,000 a month to some of these creators to get them to just keep on doing what they're doing because they just repeat the same talking points always. So I would, I would really compel anyone who considers themselves informed, considers themselves someone who can influence anybody in their lives to really think through what that influence is going to look like over the next few months because we're running out of oxygen and it will get filled with the bad actors trying to undermine the elections if it's not filled otherwise. Thank you so much, Stuart and Jory, for joining us for this. Thank you, guys. Thank you both.